Hold on. Oh, that's fine. Okay. Well, we're keeping a really tight schedule, and I apologize for introducing our speakers so shortly after you've sat down to eat and are just starting your conversations. But we have a number of people who are going to have to leave at about 1.15 to get to the airport. So I want to make sure that, that they have an opportunity to hear what promises to be a very interesting, provocative talk. Uh, I'm talking about having Michael Scheuer here. He's the former head of the Bin Laden unit at the CIA's Counterterrorism Center. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Imperial Hubris, Why the West is Losing the War on Terror, and another book, Through Our Enemy's Eyes, Osama Bin Laden, Radical Islam, and the Future of America. And I uh, also uh, know that right now he's, he's writing for the Jamestown Foundation, which is represented here by its uh, head. Um, we have uh, Glenn Howard here at the head table. And also he teaches at Georgetown. And I just, on a personal note too, I've never had the privilege of introducing Anonymous. So, <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Anonymous, uh, Michael Schroeder. Thank, Thank you. you. I never thought that this was a topic for, for dinnertime conversation, but a la last week I was invited to, to attend uh, or to be the attraction at an Italian wine dinner uh, called Food for Thought, and they had been inviting people who did cookbooks on, uh, on Italian cooking until I was kind of the icebreaker, I guess. And so we went from uh, you know, uh, spaghetti to suicide. I'd like, I'd like to talk today uh, a little about where we stand in the war on terror, and I've called the talk Bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, and the war that's barely begun. Today, America is engaged in a war of survival against an enemy unlike any other our country has fought. We have been so engaged for the best part of a decade, and yet we have not begun to understand our opponents. Led and personified by Osama bin Laden, our enemy is at once more complicated and more simple than has been recognized. Religion is the key to understanding our enemy, and so far we have fought shy of making that judgment. Bin Laden and those he heads have presented us with a struggle we cannot avoid, a conflict in which the choices are not between war and peace, but between war and endless war. We cannot talk our way out of this war, and we cannot and must not try to appease our way out of this war. At the same time, we cannot win and survive if we use the only two tools now available to us, intelligence operations and military actions, although harsher and more prolonged applications of each will be required. This is the context in which I will present this talk, a talk which will also have a decidedly nationalistic edge. It will focus on how America got to its present position and how America, will to how America will fail to defeat the enemy if we do not recognize that our enemy's most important motivation is what we do in the world, not who we are or what we believe. And if we do not review, debate, and perhaps alter the status quo of our policies toward the Islamic world. This, is, this in an effort to permit America to employ a range of war fighting tools that is not limited to military and intelligence operations. The stage was set for our present dilemma more than 15 years ago. As you will recall, the buzzword change dominated discourse on world affairs in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Gorbachev held power in a Soviet Union that was failing economically at home, militarily in Afghanistan, and as an imperial power in Eastern Europe. The buzzword became a mantra, and through most, most of the 1990s, the United States and the West sidelined reality in favor of Kant about the end of history and the approaching triumph of, of globalization, the supposedly inevitable spread of democratic political systems, capitalist economies, and secularism. On the eve of history's end in 1988, an expatriate Saudi named Osama bin Laden and a few Confederates formed an organization they called Al-Qaeda, in English, the base. It is fair to say that the Western media took no notice of this new entity, <clears throat> the men who formed it or the goals they established. Western intelli intelligence services did little better than the media, media, and that's a pity. Bin Laden and his associates, Islamic zealots all, 
formed al-Qaeda to ensure that there would be no dissipation of the momentum emerging from what clearly was the Soviet Union's coming defeat in Afghanistan. These men acted to institutionalize the organizational networks that provided manpower, money, and expertise to the Afghan Mujahideen and their non-Afghan Muslim allies. They sought to, sh to make al-Qaeda a central source from which Islamic resistance groups and insurgencies around the world would draw military training, funding, combat veterans, travel and identity documents, religious guidance, and the other sinews of war. Bin Laden and his lieutenants also meant al-Qaeda to be a, the point around which Islamic groups would rally and find strong inspiration, leadership, and over time, an enduring and historic symbol of resistance, perseverance, and piety. This vision for al-Qaeda, I think, can be compared to a like-inspiring symbol that arose serendipitously during our own Civil War. That symbol was born when several South Carolina regiments rallied on the Stonewall Brigade, commanded by the Virginia-born Presbyterian zealot Thomas Jonathan Jackson at the Battle of First Manassas. And Al-Qaeda's leaders built their group to be the same sort of rallying point, one from which Islamists would draw inspiration, and as General Lee might have said, to decide for themselves to assume the aggressive against the United States. Today, Al-Qaeda stands as an unqualified success in the role it sought as an inspirer and facilitator of Islamic insurgencies. As we meet, Al-Qaeda veterans are assisting Islamic, Islamic insurgencies around the world as combat soldiers, military trainers, financial experts, medics, and logisticians. The scope of Al-Qaeda's activities can be seen in a simple recitation of some of the places where Al-Qaeda members are supporting Islamic insurgencies. Kashmir, Somalia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Western China, Afghanistan, Iraq, Algeria, Mindanao, and Southern Thailand. Al-Qaeda also has succeeded in serving as a rallying point and a source of inspiration for Islamic militants across the Muslim world. Noticeable over the past month, Islamist violence continues to escalate in Southern Thailand. Confrontations between the Thai government and Muslim separatists, perhaps supported by other regional Islamic insurgents, have left over 1,000 dead in the last 18 months. In Saudi Arabia, not long ago, one of the Earth's safest countries, security forces engaged in a multi-day gun battle with Al-Qaeda insurgents in Al-Aras, north of Riyadh. In addition, Saudi security forces in the industrial town of Jabal engaged in a firefight with the first reported group of veteran insurgents who had infiltrated into the kingdom after fighting in Iraq. And just last weekend, three Islamist fighters detonated explosive charges in several evening spots in Bali, Indonesia, killing themselves, 26 tourists, and wounding 100 and other, 103 other people. Reports suggest that the Jamaat al-Islamiyah, a longtime associate of al-Qaeda, is responsible for the attack. These events are in addition to the day-to-day -day internationally televised violence in Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Israel-Palestine theaters. While the violence in Thailand does not appear directly related to al-Qaeda, it and the two al-Qaeda-related attacks just mentioned definitely <coughs> follow bin Laden's goal of instigating a worldwide Islamic insurgency against America and its allies. Beyond its facilitating and inspiring roles, Al-Qaeda's founders wanted their organization to be the engine that would, after the Red Army's defeat in Afghanistan, refocus the Muslim world on the United States as the main and most lethal threat to Islam's survival. By depicting the United States in this manner, Al-Qaeda hoped to, hoped it to prompt ever larger number of Muslims to oppose America with violent means wherever and whenever possible. By any measure, Al-Qaeda's success in this endeavor must be judged still far from complete. And yet, the endeavor must also be judged as a work in progress that holds tremendous promise for success. At this point, then, it is worth asking what factors have and are driving Al-Qaeda's success in turning increasing numbers of Muslims against the United States. The first factor is Osama bin Laden himself. He is, by any standard, a great man. Great not in any positive sense, as far as Americans are concerned, but in the sense of changing the course of history. How many individuals can be said to have truly changed history 
in the last 50 years. Ronald Reagan, and with Reagan's help, Mikhail Gorbachev, certainly. Margaret Thatcher, and John Paul II, of course. Bill Gates, you bet. What about Osama bin Laden? For Americans, this man's course-altering impact on history is painfully apparent. Try boarding an aircraft, entering a federal building, or taking your fourth grade ch child's grammar school class to a museum. Note the concentric rings of defense around the White House and Washington's under siege feel. Franklin Roosevelt did not have a quarter of that security when he led America to victory over two fascist empires. And note the so-called sterile zone that was in place in the nation's capital for the inauguration. A system so invasive and militarized that one might imagine it more suitable for the Archduke Ferdinand's 1914 visit to Sarajevo rather than for the celebration by Americans of their president's inauguration. Track the, the spiraling federal deficit, much of which can be attributed directly or indirectly to bin Laden and Al Qaeda. Analyze polls that show Americans strongly worried for the first time about devastating domestic terrorist attacks and the slow erosion of civil liberties. Inescapably, Osama bin Laden must be judged a remarkable and a remarkably dangerous man. He is a veteran soldier thrice wounded, a construction engineer, a modern chief executive officer, a devout Muslim, family man and humanitarian, a soft-spoken but eloquent orator, and an implacable enemy of America. He is in many ways cut from the same cloth as other heroes of Islamic history. He is what Americans and Britons in the 19th century would have called a worthy enemy, an enemy so dangerous and talented that he had to be respected, and whose measure had to be precisely taken before he could be utterly defeated. In the 20th century, he might well have been called a freedom fighter, dining at the White House if he was on our side. Adding to bin Laden's stature as a history changer is the fact that for many Muslims he is a combination of Robin Hood and St. Francis of Assisi, risking his life to defend his people while assisting those in need. Perhaps most notably, bin Laden is one of the only world leaders, Muslim or Western, who consistently matches his words to his deeds. A second factor in Al-Qaeda's success is that the threat posed by bin Laden the man is sharpened by the fact that the Muslim world is an utter wasteland in terms of political leadership and heroic figures. No better validation of this reality can be, <coughs> excuse me, can be had than by recognizing that Saddam Hussein until scooped from his underground home, was bin Laden's only rival as a hero and leader in the Islamic world. In Saddam, we had a gangster, an apostate, and a mass murderer, who on those counts was despised overwhelmingly by Muslims. Yet he was respected and cheered on by the Arabs as one leader who defied the United States. Beyond Saddam, moreover, lay a Muslim world led by corrupt, tyrannical, and often effete kings, princes, dictators, and coup-installed generals. These men pay lip service to Islam, but, but they rule police states as wholly owned family businesses, complete with an opulence in palaces and mansions that would make the French sun king look like a backwoodsman on a tight budget. Potemkin Muslims at home, these rulers are more at home in Zurich, Monte Carlo, the south of France, Kentucky's horse country, and the upscale flesh markets of Southeast Asia. In the midst of this Muslim leadership desert, Osama bin Laden took center stage in 1999, 1996 by declaring war on the United States. He quickly turned out to be much more than an angry and unusually tall Saudi. He was and is, from his first public words, a speaker of eloquent, and as Professor Bernard Lewis has noted, almost poetic Arabic, an invaluable gift in a culture that prizes communication skills. Bin Laden, moreover, is the son of the wealthiest non-royal family in Saudi Arabia, and a son who has chose to abandon his family and its secure and luxurious lifestyle for the life of danger and uncertainties as a holy warrior in Afghanistan and Sudan. Parenthetically, it is hard not to have some respect for a man who not only volunteers to fight, but also lives a life that requires him to drink Afghan and Sudanese water for a quarter century. Lacking rivals, and blessed with eloquence and literally and figuratively intestinal fortitude, 
Bin Laden also is a man whose character traits are the stuff from which the heroes of Islamic history are made. He is a quiet, pious man, speaks without bravado, dresses without show, and despite his noble birth, has fought and bled in the trenches of the Mujahideen. He has a common touch with the common man and shows deference to his elders and Islamic scholars and jurists. Like Saladin, bin Laden has, in the eyes of Muslims, defended Islam against Christendom's attack when no other Muslim leader dared to act. Bin Laden's words and actions strike chords of historical memory among the extraordinarily history-aware Muslim masses, and their sustained reverberations contribute to his growing influence in the Islamic world. The third factor powering Al-Qaeda's growing influence lies, quite simply, in the opaqueness of America's political leaders and elites. Today, bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and their allies have only one indispensable ally, and that ally is U.S. foreign policy toward the Islamic world. The U.S. policies specified by bin Laden are perceived as attacks on Islam by most Muslims, if the polling of recent years is correct, and as always, perception is reality. These policies were not made by mad or evil men. No policymaker or strategist set out to deliberately cause a war with Islam, but war we have. And these policies are driving our current enemies and enlisting more to their side each day. The answer is then, why do we have these policies? Two reasons, I believe, best answer that question. First, the men and women who make policy know little about America. Indeed, most would not know an American founder from an Atlantic flounder. They have jettisoned, they have jettisoned assuming they know of it, George Washington's brilliant nation-preserving foreign policy formula of non-intervention and adopted the mindless and stick your nose where it doesn't belong internationalism of the bloody-handed fantasist Woodrow Wilson. Not satisfied to be a democratic example for the world, these men and women, to paraphrase Smedley Butler, have opted to become the bully boy hit men who act in the name but ignore the substance of the legacy left by Washington, Jefferson, and John Quincy Adams. Second, these men and women believe their own rhetoric. For them, God is on their side. A worldwide secular democracy is inevitable and yearned for, yearned for by all the Earth's peoples. Those who resist the beneficial tide of history are medieval criminals, and those obscurantists who oppose America's enforcement of God's will and democracy's inevitability must and will be easily and utterly smashed by America's technologically superior military, which alone without effective political, economic, diplomatic, and propaganda policies will carry the day. Filled with this smug and some might say absurd confidence, and still stung by the rhetorical lashing America received at the hands of Iran's Ayatollah Khomeini, our elites are not listening to bin Laden's words. They assume that he is ranting a la the late Ayatollah's scathing litany about the great Satanists of American society its debauchery, lack of morals, man-made laws, pornographic movies, and gender equality. Because they are not hearing or heeding bin Laden's words, our leaders assert that he and Al-Qaeda are driven by an apocalyptic vision that demands the complete destruction of America's democracy, freedom, and liberties. With respect for my betters, Republican and Democrat, there could not be a more inaccurate assessment of bin Laden's arguments or goals nor one that is more certain to lead to America's eventual defeat. Bin Laden's gripe, if you will, has little to do with the vague but incendiary rhetorical attacks made against U.S. culture and society by Khomeini. While Bin Laden shares the grouchy old Iranian's distaste for our culture, he has taken the far more effective tack of focusing on specific U.S. policies toward the Islamic world in his effort to focus Muslim hatred on the United States. On bin Laden's indictment sheet are just six items. U.S. military and civilian presence on the Arab Arabian Peninsula, the U.S. military occupation of Afghanistan and Iraq and its military presence in other countries, 
unqualified U.S. political, economic, and military support for Israel, the ability of Washington until recently to press Muslim oil producers to keep prices at levels acceptable to Western consumers, U.S. support for regimes that suppress Muslims, including Russia in Chechnya, India in Kashmir, and China in Western China, and decades-old U.S. support for apostate and tyrannical governments across the Islamic world, including Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Algeria, and others. Bin Laden's decision to focus on U.S. foreign policy shows more than a touch of genius. By doing so, he tapped a well of anti-American sentiment that spans the Islamic world's ideological spectrum, from whiskey-drinking Pakistani generals to Salafist missionaries preaching among the Moros of Mindanao. While it is absolutely true that not all or even most Muslims support bin Laden's military attacks on the United States, it is just as true that most Muslims deeply resent and even hate the U.S. policies bin Laden has identified as attacks on Islam. In addition, in an Islamic world that is divided by sectarian differences, as well as by theological differences within sects, bin Laden's focus on U.S. foreign policy has acted as something akin to a glue of unity, allowing many Muslims to temporarily downplay sectarian, cultural, and ethnic arguments in order to focus on the United States. It is clear that opposition to each of these U.S. policies is or has become a gut religious issue for Muslims. Far more Muslims, for example, are willing to sacrifice their lives to defeat U.S. policies than ever were willing to attack the so-called U.S. cultural threat, identified, demonized, and railed against by the Ayatollah. It is time, I think, for Americans to debate these policies not to blame, denigrate, or fault America, but rather to review these Cold War era policies to make sure that they still do the only thing that they must do, serve and protect America. And while I and all of us have a preference for how such a debate would culminate, the debate itself is the key. America's future and its meaning as a nation must be decided by its people not by a, pi, by, a pi, par, by a bipartisan aristocracy of power that now controls the reins of foreign policy and brooks no debate about its decisions and actions. Bin Laden's personality and character, the lack of credible Muslim leaders, and hatred for U.S. foreign policies have combined to yield a growing threat to America, one that is underestimated because, of our, leaders, because our leaders blindly assert that Al-Qaeda's target is our way of life. Frankly, time is not on America's side. We and our allies are in a truly momentous race, one that at the moment we are clearly losing. We are at a point in history where Al-Qaeda and bin Laden are changing into Al-Qaedaism and bin Ladenism, a philosophy and a movement rather than a man and an organization. This movement is geographically diverse, is a geographically diverse assortment of Islamic groups that have backburnered plans to destroy national governments, be they in Egypt, Algeria, or Saudi Arabia, and are gradually adopting bin Laden's three-part strategy of attacking American citizens, our interests, and our economy, thereby creating costs that will drive America from as much of the Islamic world as possible, thereby depriving Israel and Muslim tyrannies of the U.S. support that ensures their survival. Again. Time is of the essence. For nearly a decade, the United States has faced a formidable foe in Al-Qaeda and bin Laden, a foe, in which, a foe which is far from defeated. Now we are about to face, indeed may already be facing, a much larger and more formidable foe in the worldwide movement that has been engendered by bin Laden's leadership, Al-Qaeda's attacks, and Muslim hatred for quarter-century-old U.S. policies toward the Islamic world. In short, America is in a box of its own making. We need room to maneuver in the Islamic world, and we need Muslims to again give us the benefit of the doubt. The answer is a yet-to-be-determined combination of more aggressive warfare and policy change. This will lead to substantial U.S. disengagement from the region, and that will slow the growth there of hatred for America. 
This will not be an easy fix, but over time, a satisfactory combination of the two will better defend America and defeat the enemy. Let me suggest a few possibilities. Change the rules of engagement for, U for the U.S. military so it can make America's might felt to the maximum extent. And this includes an approach so destructive that local populations will demand peace. As Philip Sheridan once said, our opponents should be left only with eyes with which to weep. This means getting serious about Iraq and Afghanistan. Get brutal and effective or get out. It takes no military genius to see that both wars are lost if each country's borders are not closed. With open borders, every Marine killed is wasted because nothing is being done to stem the enemy's reinforcements or supply lines. Destroying the enemy, which must be done as assiduously as we eradicated the Japanese from Okinawa and drove the Wehrmacht from the hedgerows of Normandy, cannot begin while the borders are unsealed. It is criminal and fatal to American security to commit our armed forces if we have no intention of winning. Second, stop the endless congressional, presidential, and media debate and close our own borders until we get a handle on the extent of our immigration problem. Until this happens, little of what we do against Al-Qaeda and other terrorists makes America safer in terms of attacks inside the United States. This has nothing to do with human rights or civil liberties. It has everything to do with national survival and giving all levels of U.S. law enforcement a fighting chance to defeat the enemy. Begin today to accelerate conversion to alternative energies and further develop U.S. energy resources. America has no national interests in the Persian Gulf save freedom of navigation. And as we eliminate our energy dependence there, the lack of U.S. interests in the region will, become in, will come into sharp relief. In particular, energy self-sufficiency will allow us to stop supporting the Gulf's Muslim tyrannies, which now control our economic destiny, manufacture and export anti-Americanism, and make our championship of freedom a pure, pure and even spectacular hypocrisy. If U.S. politics forth, if U.S. politicians generally, genuinely want to be the leader of the few, free world and not just pose and preen, they should drive the Europeans and the Japanese toward alternative energies. They are greatly more dependent on Persian Gulf energy than America, and since 1945, we have protected their access. Get something done at one of these G8 summits. Tell the Europeans and the Japanese where America is going energy-wise Ask them to get on the train with us and tell them that if they don't, that's okay. But they better start building navies and expeditionary forces to assure their access. Fifth, decide what America wants in terms of an Israel-Palestine settlement. Call both sides in and say, 50 years of your feckless, infantile, brutal, and utterly selfish behavior is enough for us. Here's the deal we want implemented. If you don't, you're on your own and can kill each other to your heart's content. In doing so, we must remind Americans that Israel ceased being the underdog once it acquired nuclear weapons which cannot be accounted for. Sixth, stop building Muslim hatred by supporting the Russians in Chechnya and Beijing in Western China. Regarding Russia, President Putin will do what he must to win that war but we contribute nothing by supporting him with rhetoric, and we are deeply stained by Russian barbarism in the Muslim world. If we cannot criticize, remain silent. Regarding China, Beijing is conducting a genocide against Uyghur Muslims in Western China by inundating the region with Han Chinese, exactly as it is doing to the people of Tibet. There is no reason for America to earn Muslim hatred by supporting this Chinese genocide. In closing, let me again refer to our own civil war. An increasing number of Muslims are rallying to bin Laden's forthright stand against American policy, just as those South Carolinians rallied on Jackson's brigade at First Manassas. And just as that battle transformed the virtually unknown Thomas Jackson into the inspiring and invincible heroine legend Stonewall Jackson, 
so too have Bin Laden's words and actions to date with a strong assist from U.S. foreign policy and two plus decades of democracy crusading hypocrisy transformed a once obscure Saudi into an inspirational Islamic leader, hero, and even legend. And today, as U.S. military and intelligence forces try to achieve the worthy goal of killing Bin Laden, it is, is essential that we keep one other fact about Jackson's career in mind. The most vicious and bloodiest fighting of our own civil war occurred after Jackson was killed at Chancellorsville. Thereafter, the Army of Northern Virginia was surely led by the substantive brilliance of Robert E. Lee, but just as surely it was fueled by the inspirational legend and heroic memory of an implacably anti-United States Presbyterian zealot named Thomas Jackson. And so it will be even if Bin Laden is killed. The United States has turned a corner in its struggle with, the Islam, with Islamist militancy. But the road ahead, <coughs> excuse me, but the road on which we now travel, because of our leaders' personal arrogance and their ignorance of American history, is leading to greater bleeding in terms of both our citizens' lives and their treasure. And along that road, America will continue to encounter a foe inspired by the legend and heroic memory of an implacably anti-United States Islamic zealot named Osama bin Laden. Thank you very much. Sure, if you'd like. If you've got, I, took, I took too much time and I. You know. Well, thank you for a very provocative. Uh, I think the applause speaks for itself. Uh, thank you all. What a very interesting presentation that is. Uh, Mike Troyer is certainly available to take questions now. Some of you might be uh, wanting to get ready for your uh, airport. Do we have to make an announcement about the airport run, Brian? Uh, okay, sure. Well, there's a shuttle leaving within the next five minutes for those of you who want to. Can I ask a question first? Can, so, yeah. can, no, can we wait five minutes? We, we can hold off if you guys are comfortable with that. Hold off as long as you can because this is going to be an interesting discussion. I just know some of the other points. Michael, I just don't understand your emphasis on. You know, now that we've gone to war, we have to fight a total war, a la Sharon and, and German, and the Civil War, or uh, invoking the analogy of, uh, of Germany and Japan in World War II. When the United States defeated those adversaries, there was no hinterland. There was no outer world. But there are a million Muslims. I mean, what kind of an effect would this kind of total war have on this larger world. It would almost inevitably exacerbate the very problem that uh, you're concerned about. We're, what we're concerned about is defending America. And we're, 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 in a, we're in a war, whether we like it or not, and now we're committed to it. We have, uh, we're, we're engaged in the culture, against the culture, in which force is still a lingua franca. Saddam ruled, for example, because he put the fear of the Lord, the fear of Saddam, into people. So far, we have fought Islamic forces in Afghanistan and Iraq, and in their eyes, we've lost. They look up, we've attacked them, we've invaded, they're still there, they're still fighting. Is it a wise idea to fight them in the first place? I think that's a debatable point. Once you begin, you need to let, they used to say, let Reagan be Reagan, let the military be the military. You don't brief your Marines with, with uh, lawyers before they go into Fallujah. You need to make an impression in the Islamic world, and we haven't. There's no reason for them to be afraid of us. But it's not enough alone without changing policy, which is the point I'm trying to make. It has to be too, we've never fought a war before with just using military and intelligence forces. It's, it's a silly way to fight. America's never done it. Uh, yeah, um, my question is uh, kind of a follow-up to David. You, you stress how much Osama bin Laden has been able to unify people who are not naturally united and how our policies have aided and abetted in the project, but I don't see how a, a Sherman-esque solution is going to divide these people. It's going to kill them. <laughs> it's not really a tension. As many as you need to. What else are you going to do, sir? Well, you how do you defend America? going to be this liberal. I'd change my policy rather than get in a war with a billion people. 
Well, continuing to behave in a, in a manner that is not aggressive and forceful will just encourage the war. And again, if you listen to what I said, it, it has to be complemented by, this, by a, a, a more non-interventionist foreign policy. Because at the base of this problem is that we're in the way. Their real goal is to destroy the Israelis and the, the tyrannies that have governed the Muslim world since the end of World War II. We have to disengage. We have to let the Saudis go their own way, which is important, uh, which makes oil uh, policy very important. Sir. Uh, Michael, a less uh, uh, contentious question. What's your assessment of the Karzai government these days in Afghanistan? I think really, sir, they're yesterday's dog food. Uh, <laughs> we. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Come on, tell us what you really think. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in, the, in terms of Afghanistan, the, the, the kind of whine that always comes from the international community and from much of the American establishment is that we abandoned the Afghans after the Soviets left. The Afghans' real problem is that we didn't abandon them after the Soviets left. We sent Zalmil Khalizad and the same crew we sent there in 2001, uh, in 1991, to install people who had not fought the Soviets, former communists, people who hid during the war, either in India or Western Europe running restaurants, and brought them back and shut out the guys who actually fought for 10 years. We're doing the same thing again. Karzai is, I think, a brilliant man. He's an inspirational man, but he's about as much an Afghan as I am. And as long as our bayonets are there, and as long as foreign aid comes in, he'll probably remain. But the idea of a consolidation of, of power by that group of people inside Afghanistan over the longer term, sir, is uh, like buying Confederate war bonds now. I think it's a very, very long shot. Plus, someone spoke earlier about the, uh, um, I think it was you, Mr. Donnelly, who spoke, Dr. Donnelly, about the uh, budding, budding rapprochement between the United States and the Indians. What's that, what that's doing, certainly, is convincing the Pakistanis that they bet on the wrong horse again by supporting the Americans. So the, over the, as, we, as we continue to um, exercise with the Indians with our forces and give them some kind of civilian nuclear aid of all things, uh, the generals are going to say to Musharraf, we told you so, and they're going to start supporting or, or increase their support for the Taliban and for Taliban-like forces. So, you know, everything meshes together at some point, but we seem, to ha we seem to look at the world in hermetically sealed boxes, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult situation, sir, and we're not playing it very smart. Sir. Yeah, I just wondered, the intelligence community seems to think that the Iraq uh, insurgency and war there are a bigger breeding ground for terrorists than the Afghan campaign. I'm yeah. just wondering if your impression, is that correct? Or? Yeah, Afghanistan was always a, a backwater in the Islamic world, even after the Soviets invaded. And, and really, the, the Arabs didn't come to fight with the Afghans until late in the 80s, 87, 88, 86 time frame. Uh, Iraq, however, was the center of Islamic civilization for 800 years. It is a place that is, um, uh, uh, a, they call a mujahideen magnet that's uh, magnitudes larger than Afghanistan ever was. And uh, we've certainly uh, created uh, um, a cause celeb in the Islamic world that's going to be much greater than Afghanistan. Yeah. Tom. Mr. Troy, I'm sorry. You think we, we the United States government, knows within one square mile where Bin Laden is now? No. So? We, ha we absolutely have them trapped in South Asia. We, uh, <laughs> there's, there's, there's no doubt about that. No, sir. We, had, we, had, uh, we knew eight to ten times during Clinton's administration what bedroom he was sleeping in at night. We could have captured him or killed him, and they chose not to do it. Now he lives along the border in Afghanistan, which is about 1,500 kilometers long, has the highest mountains on Earth, and is uh, populated by a population who values defending their guests with their lives and who are very conservative Muslims. We have to work very hard. We might get lucky, but no, I don't think we know where he is. And we've suffered a tremendous drain of resources from Afghanistan to Iraq. There's just not enough 
men on the ground. Sir. I hear cars, I had some great pocket crop this year. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's one of the oddest things when, when uh, after the, the coal was bombed in Yemen, we, uh, the intelligence community was directed to maintain a target deck of uh, targets in Afghanistan to be attacked the moment we got attacked again. One of the things that we put on there were uh, what are really small factory towns in Afghanistan, the only factory towns they have which produce heroin. And uh, when the war started, they threw the target deck away and refused to put the, the heroin factories back onto it. So yeah, the biggest, someone, I was at a conference in Washington, they said 45% of the Afghan economy is heroin at the moment. So it's a huge, it's a huge issue. And the people who are the Taliban or the commanders who fought uh, the Soviets are mostly also the people who control the heroin production. And so money is not a big problem for the people who are fighting our forces in Afghanistan. Sir. Uh, Turkey from other countries that are Muslim, that are thriving in Western style, more or less Western style governments or economies, uh, what, what effect do you think it would have if Bin Laden gets killed, whether in combat or captured? Uh, I think we also hear about the the Arab street going wild, and so many cases those predictions don't take place. Yeah, I think there would be a spasm of violence, but who cares? Uh, it's more important to kill bin Laden. He's an absolutely unique figure in the Islamic world. For 50 years, we've watched the Palestinians waiting for them to go from one side of the street to the other, and they can't do it, and they're all Palestinians. Bin Laden's organization is Saudi and PAC, and Indonesian and Malaysian and Filipino, and. European Muslims. It's an absolutely unique organization and he holds it together. The, the, uh, the problem we have is that the war in Iraq broke our back in terms of counterterrorism policy, counterterrorism uh, activities, because it made the issue um, so much more a gut issue in the Islamic world. The actual invasion of Iraq by a foreign Western non-Muslim power uh, validated whatever Bin Laden said about the United States, basically. And so it's important to kill him, but it's not sufficient anymore. Uh, this, this problem will continue for the foreseeable future. I, I, you know, and I, I'm sorry the other two gentlemen left. I, didn't, I don't mean to make light of killing people. I'm simply of the opinion that we have forgotten how to use force. America very seldom wins by the limited application of force. We almost always win by the indiscriminate use of force and then coming home. Uh, sadly, uh, we haven't done either really well. Well, then let me give me an opportunity to elaborate a little bit about what would be the military strategy in Iraq. I mean, we're there, obviously, we can't rethink really that, so we're there. You're suggesting we steal the borders, that I understand. But let the military do the military thing in Iraq, what would that exactly look like? Whatever it takes to find out uh, where, the, where the Islamists hide uh, and then kill them, whether that means collateral damage or not. Uh, it's something you have to do. But then what's left? I mean, and then, and then it's well, basically, who cares? Okay. You know, I walk just walk out. Uh, the idea that somehow we're going to build a nation state there is, 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 a, is, is fantastic to me. Um, the, amount of, the, the amount of money we're pouring into that country still in the state of war and still not, we've, we've secured nothing in Iraq. Uh, it, it seems to me we have as a country a, developed a terrible problem with borders. Uh, in Afghanistan, we didn't close them and the enemy got out to come back. In Iraq, they're, they're coming in. In the United States, they're coming in. We just don't seem to understand the concept of borders. It's a terribly bloody war. You know, that's one of the greatest problems we have in what the way our, our leaders have led us on both sides of the party. This is not an easy business. This is not um, a quick, minimum casualty war. It's not like bombing the Serbs from 20,000 feet until they say uncle. This has got to be up close and personal. So you're suggesting house to house, area to area? What I'm suggesting is to look at the options you have. And the options are, as I said, get brutal and get it over or go home. 
as a historian, I don't get to do this, but I'd just like to hear kind of your prediction for the next, for the future, for the next 10 years, kind of what you think is going to happen, because obviously I don't think your policies are going to take like that. But what you suggest is not going to happen overnight. So kind of what you foresee as the future. No, I think it, none of it will happen at all, because we're, we've, we've devolved into a country where you can't uh, discuss things without having a number of items de described as hate speech. So right. It's very difficult. I think what's going to happen is we'll be attacked again in the United States, probably at a scale much larger than 9/11. And uh, uh, if he has a weapon of nuclear, a nuclear weapon, he'll use it without a question. And we've done virtually nothing to defend ourselves against that. So what are we going to do? We will stand here in the midst of that kind of destruction with nothing to hit. We'll, we'll be the world's greatest power. We'll quiver with rage, and there will be no there, there to attack. So what are we going to do? Probably we'll tighten up civil liberties. We'll make it impossible for Americans to get to museums or fly. We'll inflict the damage on ourselves, which was the exact reaction after the bombings in London. Instead of going after the enemy, Blair decided he had to have more restrictive laws in the UK, and we passed a, a, this, the Patriot Act again. I'm not saying those aren't, aren't, those aren't smart things, but you have to have a balance. You have to go and kill the bad guys. Well, the fear of fear is kind of what I, what I fear. Is the fear of uh, terrorism is almost just, it allows politicians to then restrict our civil liberties and sell this, uh, we're restricting freedom, they're fighting freedom. The, the rhetoric, to me, is almost Cold War mentality of creating this fear of the, the other, the terrorist, like we did of the communists. Well, it's going to be, what will happen again is we'll get attacked and, and they'll say it's another intelligence failure. There wasn't an intelligence failure at 9-11, there won't be the next time. It's simply a, a, an inability for reasons of political cowardice to say, listen, we've been 180 degrees long on this one, American people. They like our liberties. That's part of the immigration problem we have is they like to bring their children here, but they hate our policies. I don't know how to change that. Great powers are like are like human beings. They have a hard time saying that they're wrong. I'm afraid we saw the trailer for that movie with New Orleans, where even now liberals are demanding the role of the military to take over all civic. Well, I thought the governors did a great job there, saying, you know, take your military and stick it in your ear. One of the great fears of the founding was a was a was a standing military, and to use them more and more in the United States is. I think a mistake, but that said, Bin Laden's intention clearly is to cause an attack in the United States that only the military could handle in terms of quarantining areas, in terms of, of relieving populations or m using transportation facilities that are only, uh, only military. And uh, the impact of an attack of that sort would clearly uh, decrease our ability to project power overseas. Sir. I was in Israel last fall, and I spoke with a number of people who were mid-level officers in the Israeli army, and to a person, their recommended solution for Iraq was to facilitate the partition of Iraq, which I could see would certainly benefit Israel in terms of making a weaker Iraq. But, you know, it's sliding in that direction anyway, and they're saying just facilitate that partition and then leave, and leave it in three different sections. Probably piss the Turks off. But beyond that, what do you well, think that? I, I think that um, the, the big loser, the biggest loser in terms of the Iraq war to date is Israel. Because at the end of the day, whatever we do, is gonna, it's going to remain an unstable country, whether it's divided into three areas. And one of the most interesting comparisons uh, to make is the argument made by politicians on both sides in the United States that what we have in Iraq is, a, is like a honey pot. We're going to get all the Mujahideen to come here and we can kill them all and we don't have to worry about anything. When you read the websites from Al-Qaeda and the other Islamic groups, they say, oh my God, what an opportunity this is. Because Al-Qaeda works on the basis, the Islamists work on the basis of having contiguous safe haven. They want a Pakistan. They grew up during the, during the Afghan war. One of the reasons they didn't go to Bosnia was because there was no um, contiguous place. The, the Croats weren't going to support them, the Serbs weren't going to support them, they couldn't run and hide. In Iraq, as long as it's destabilized, they will have places to base activities into Syria, into Jordan, into uh, probably into Turkey itself for the first time. 
and eventually through Jordan and Syria toward Lebanon and Israel. So uh, while, while we look at it as a magnet for Mujahideen, the Islamists look at it as a conduit, as a flow through into the Levant. And so I really think that uh, whoever thought that this was going to strengthen the Israeli position uh, is, is probably going to be have to think again over time. Sir? Uh, I, I remember correctly you started out by saying that religion is the key to understanding this war. Yes, sir. And I think in your book you say that we should be reading Ben Laden's points on this. Yes, sir. But how would your military solution bring about, <clears throat> bring about the kind of changes in their religious outlook that we need? There is no chance to change their religion, sir. What we need to do is focus on them killing themselves. What you're looking at is kind of a pre-reformation, I think, Islamic society. And, and once, they, once we're out of the way, there's so many scores to settle within the Islamic world because of dictators or police states or, or sectarian differences that that's what, sh you know, if you were a Machiavellian, you would probably support bin Laden against the Saudis and the Kuwaitis, except for oil. So you're saying they have to go through the 30 years so, uh, religious wars? And I don't know, you know, it's a mugs game to predict what's going on, but clearly the problems within the Islamic world are, the overwhelming, are overwhelmingly internal, and they're directed, their, their ire is directed at us because we, they perceive our policies are perpetuating a status quo that is um, negative for most Muslims. I think the whole idea of changing curriculums and changing you know, imposed by the West is just something that's going to make them more mad at us. It's, it's like saying, you know, to the Fairfax County Public Schools in Virginia that Osama bin Laden wants you to introduce, you know, praying five times a day. It's, mm -hmm. it's not going to wash. Sir? You were rather timid in acknowledging how much uh, atomic weapons may be able to make Israel Well, certainly they're a major target of this activity, sir. I'm, you know, I'm not one that believes that if you gave me a piece of paper and gave me two hours and sat down, if I could figure out a single strategic interest that the U.S.-Israeli alliance provides to America, uh, the emotional commitment, the guilt commitment of the United States to Israel is huge. But in terms of this discussion of a strategic relationship, there just isn't any. And uh, I'm always one that comes back to thinking that what we should do is to protect America and devil take the hindmost. So I, you know, I don't know what the Israelis will do. They sunk our, you know, they sunk one of our ships. Maybe they'll launch a missile at us. Yeah. Like in, uh, yes. In Vietnam, yes. That's exactly right. But that's the nature of an insurgency and of a guerrilla war. That's what we were facing when we went in there. Uh, it, it, and if you don't want to fight it in the way it needs to be fought, fought you should come home. General Odom, who was the, the um, director of NSA for a while, the National Security Agency, wrote a column the other morning that said, what's wrong with cutting and running? Basically, he said, everything we face now in Iraq, we're, we're going to face if we're there or we're not there. So why not leave? It's, it's uh, you know, the idea that, that, and Mr. Donnelly, maybe you know what the tooth to tail ratio is for the American military. But if we have 120,000 soldiers and Marines in Iraq today, or 140,000, how many combat soldiers on a day-to-day -day basis do we have out of that? 30,000, maybe? Yeah. You know, the, the ratio of, you know, it makes what it takes. It's probably about two thirds, two thirds support people, I would say. Yeah. So, the, you know, if, so if it's two thirds, you, you, you come from, if we say 150, you come down to 50,000 combat troops on any given day to, to control a place with borders open to enemy countries and mountainous terrain the size of California, I think they say. It's like looking at Afghanistan and saying that 20,000 troops are going to do what 120,000 Soviets couldn't do. Um, 
there's a big difference because we're not out killing Afghans at the moment. But uh, if, if it comes to that, it, it will become cl clear very quickly that 20,000 Americans and Westerners can't handle Afghanistan. So the reality of the situation in Iraq, I think, is that we, that I, I don't know how the administration can argue that we have enough troops there if we really want to win. If we want to bleed, we have just a, right, a, not the right number. Tom. On the, the two-part proposition, first we kill the bad guys and then we leave, why not just leave? I don't think that's a bad idea, but that's, again, that that's, needs to be debated. Um, I, I think it's, 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 it's a pretty tough time for America when you, when you raise something like that and you're not a patriot or you're not an American, you're, a, uh, you know, you're somewhat less of a citizen because you think there might be a better answer. Uh, th that's what that's what Odom's point was, and Odom is the hard, hard cold warrior of hard cold warriors, and and he said, you know, punch this ticket and go home. Senator Aiken said it in about 1965, declare victory and leave. Yeah. Vietnam. Well, we seem to be driving this plane into the mountain, so I don't know if we're ready to even discuss it, sir. In a number of instances throughout history, it's apparent that leaders um, continue to be involved in a, in a war as a diversion to domestic failures or other problems that they may have to face. To what extent do you think that may be operative here? Oh, I don't, I, you know, I don't think that that's the case. I think there's, there's uh, some people who genuinely, genuinely believe that America is somehow uh, not only destined but but obligated to install democracies around the world. And we just happen to have a, uh, what do they call it a, in, for fissile, a critical mass of people that thought they were going to plant these democracies around the world. I think it's, um, again, I, I, I think these, the, the, many of our leaders just don't understand how much pain and agony and, and valiant courage it's taken America to get here. And to put it on a CD-ROM to give it to Karzai and say, here you go, Hamid, six months and let's have uh, precinct level elections and, and the rest of it is, is kind of madness. I think there's probably more stupidity than duplicity in, in what's happened. Just more stupidity. Sir. Uh, Mike, what's your assessment of the level of radicalism in the American you know, it's a hard thing to tell. I, what, what, what I take some comfort in, Tom, is, is that I worked very closely for the last decade with European security services on the Islamist issue. And, and they were always very um, looking down their nose at the Americans as the most racist people. And, you know, there is, isn't that an irony? And, and there's no one more that I've run into around the world more racist than the French and the Germans and the rest of them. And I think our country still has, a, has an assimilating power that is um, a terrific thing. And when you look at the polls, it, it's a very stark dichotomy in the Islamic world that you know, the, the poll that hates our foreign policy is about maxed out. It's 80, 85, 90%, sometimes more in various Muslim countries. But the same polls in the same countries show 55, 60% admire the equity of American society admire the ability of parents to educate children, to provide health care, to provide basic food and shelter. And so the danger, one of the great dangers for America over time is that we become hated not for our policies but as Americans. And I think that's the real danger that we don't appreciate in things like Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay and the purported desecration of the Quran. Not that, that those in themselves are going to cause a huge uprising of, of a sort, although several of them did, to cause small uprisings. But the danger is we don't want to be hated just because we're Americans. I think most Americans who travel in the Islamic world today are greeted cordially um, and generously. Uh, but people are also very clear that we hate your policies. Uh, in the American Muslim community, the, 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 we probably would not have much of a worry if it wasn't for the Saudis. The Saudis have been busy for a quarter century in the United States funding the most radical kinds of Islamic uh, theology, sending the graduates of their universities here to organize mosques and children's uh, organizations and schools. It's a very, um, 
I think over the long term it's quite threatening. Uh, I'm not sure anybody has studied it enough. There was a couple of articles by John Miller in the National Review that were interesting. Uh, but otherwise, I don't know, sir. I was curious, you've been listening to this public debate that we've been having among the politicians. Who do you think is most intellectually sound and politically has the courage to try to argue for the right thing and still seek election? I don't think I've seen anybody. anybody. No There's, way. It's almost whenever we get attacked or the British get attacked or another of our allies gets attacked, it's like Pavlov's dogs emerging from the left part of the Democratic Party, the right wing of the, conser of the Republicans, the conservatives, the social democrats in Europe, or the socialists in Spain, and they all say, oh, we're getting attacked because we have liberties and freedoms and civil rights. And so who's got the courage to say it? Even McCain has, has suddenly become uh, the hate us for our freedoms and our liberties and, and that kind of stuff. And if you want to believe that, that's fine, but that leads to, de that leads to defeat. You know, at base, what you need to do is understand your enemy so you can destroy him. And if you don't understand him, uh, you're going to be defeated at the end of the day. I haven't seen an American politician willing to stand up and say that. Uh, we live in the fossil fuel age, right? And sir. when they run out of oil, what's going to happen to their economy? They're going to be done like dinner, sir. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And I, I, you know, that's exactly the point. We should get to the position where we can tell them to drink it. Uh, <laughs> well, Malaysia, is, I think, is a, a little different story because that's a different, a, a different heritage for that. The problem we have across the Middle East, I think. Is, is that we've made a mockery of our own heritage. For 30 years or longer, we've supported police states. And uh, what happens to Egypt? Well, why do we care? Um, if, if, you know, if, if at some point uh, Egypt falls, I guess we save $3 billion a year. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not one that believes that, that things can go on as they are for, for very much longer in terms of America's own interests. I, I don't think that's what I meant. What, what happens to the stability um, in the Middle East so that you can get through the Suez Canal? You can, you know. I don't know the answer to that, Mary Ellen. But I, I know that the longer we support people like Mubarak and the Al Sauds and the Kuwaitis, the more pain America suffers. There, there, it has to be a, a policy that allows us to, to, to disengage. And it, it seems to me that the beginning of that has to come somehow from energy. I don't know how else to get around that, because otherwise we're just, we're just choked by, by people who have um, no real concern for how much we suffer. I'd like to go back to the question, Go ahead. On uh, the radicalization of Islam in the United States. I don't think we're looking at the right place where most of, of uh, the Muslims are kept in the United States, and that's in our prison system. And I'm a retired prison warden, and I can tell you they're very radicalized in the prison yeah. system. And we're about five or six years away from releasing a lot of them, because that's when the, the long-term uh, 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 sentences are starting to, to uh, expire. Yeah. And, you're gonna, and, and that is a population of people that is drawn from absolutely the lowest strata of our society, and they're Muslim, and they're radicalized. We have hell to pay in that perspective. I, you, you would know better than I do in that. I suspect you're correct. Yeah. Uh, certainly that's what the Europeans are finding. They have, from what from you read in the media, they have entire sections of their prisons that the guards don't go to because they're run by Islamic clerics. Uh, Sir? Uh, in the uh, current issue of the New Republic magazine, there's a long, <coughs> Four or five page article, I'll, I'll read a, a book with you that I read last night, <coughs> of Robert Kaplan's latest book, the title of which I've forgotten. Imperial Grunts, it's Imperial called. Imperial Grunts. Yes, sir. And uh, that article is very, very critical of the hardline policies that uh, he, I have not read that book. I, I, I have read the, one of his earlier ones about 
warrior ethics, yes, or warrior politics, which I think is roughly the same sort of thing. <clears throat> I, I'm just wondering what, what you think of it, whether you have read that book or or his uh, previous book, Warrior Politics, Warrior Ethics. The, the warrior, I think it's called the Warrior Ethos or something ethos, like that. Yeah. I haven't read Imperial Grunts. Um, I thought the, the Warrior Ethics book was very good, except for the last chapter, which I, I could never make any sense out of. That, uh, That's the one we put it all together. Yeah, he tried to put it all, and I just didn't understand it. And then there was a, another article in the Atlantic where he talked about the glories of only using special forces around the world, and I think that's, a, and I think that's what the Grunts book is about. Um, isn't it? Simply telling the stories of guys who are in the front. I see. So it's it's a mixture. There's there's certain you know, special forces on them, but there's also foreign area officers, Marines in Fallujah, yeah. and, and and there's more to come working through the services. Well, I think Kaplan's a you know extraordinarily good writer, and in, in, in terms of Afghanistan during the Soviet War, he wrote a book called Soldiers of God, I think, which is one of the best books there is. But um, I think. What I had understood about his in focus on special forces, to me, just connoted the idea that he didn't really understand the immensity of the problem we faced. So I guess I'd, I would leave it there, sir, because I haven't read the book yet. Okay, Ma'am, oh, one more? I, just, I have one last, last question. question. Yeah, I thank you very much for, for laying out a, a direction. You know, this is what we can do. That, I very much appreciate it, because we haven't heard much of that. And it, it, it seems to me that if you take part of your suggestions and make them the aim of what you suggest, that you might have, beginning with, we need to be uh, energy efficient, we need to close our borders. It seems to me that if somebody ran on that platform, you know, you can't get too complicated no. in a political system, but it seemed to me if you ran on that platform and you'd have a great up, up, uh, support among the people of the United States. I think somebody's just got to have the courage to, to do it. You know, when you, most of the people who speak about borders now are immediately accused of being racist or anti, you know, Hispanic or anti-Muslim, and it really only has to do with enforcing the laws that are on the books. Um, I think the American, I don't think Americans are basically anti-immigrant. They're anti Law breakers. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, but I, I don't. I haven't heard but many if people you say it. Any luck anywhere at breaking out a part of portion of that that clearly the American people would follow. You know, I've I've been uh, I've been described as an equal opportunity basher, <laughs> and I've also been uh, 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 monikered from virtually every point of the political spectrum. So I haven't found anyone who wants to break anything out. I'm, every, I'm everything from, a, from a, a warmonger on one side to an appeaser on another to a Bush hater. My personal favorite is right-wing Buchananite anti-Semitic isolationist, <laughs> which, <laughs> which, which has kind of a ring to it, I think. Well, I understand that. <laughs> yeah. No. You have got to have an appeal to the people that is right here. And energy and the immigration issue are two things that I think are going to be overlooked and would be just key to anybody taking the lead in this presidential. Well, I don't see many people out there going to do that, ma'am. I'm afraid. Uh, I, I think what I think I think someone will eventually come along, but I don't think it's going to happen until after there's you know tens, twenty thousand more dead Americans inside the United States. Because Are you I, interested in running for office? I am not. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't be elected. I have a. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, really sir. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Sir. Well, that concludes our conference, War and Empire. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you have found it insightful. Uh, I seek your ideas. If you have ideas for conferences that we should be uh, looking into in the future, uh, by all means, you know how to get in touch with us and let us know. Thank you again very much. Very good. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. You're very kind. <laughs> um, just. Uh,
I sent the non-warriors scurrying, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>